Welcome to another Henrico's Environmental Action Resource Team podcast. I'm Jeff Whitell, and I'm really excited um, for this episode because there's a certain um, buzz in the air, and you'll find out a little bit more about that. So first of all, we've got some guests today. We've got Ed Olson. He is the Henrico Extension Agent. And then we also have Linda McBride, who she is a master gardener, and she's also a master naturalist. So, um, first of all, welcome. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. (laughs) Really excited. Um, In fact, I was actually out in a garden today looking at flowers and stuff like that, so I had pollen over my pants. That's generally (laughs) what you find when you're in a garden. (laughs) (laughs) So, speaking of buzz in the air, okay, um, we're going to be talking about pollinator gardens. So, what... um, What's a pollinator garden? Well, a pollinator garden provides plants that are called nectar plants, and they they create both nectar and pollen, and they also should contain host plants, which are plants for caterpillars to eat. And so that way you can both get the butterflies that come into nectar, and you can get butterflies coming into lay eggs. But pollinator gardens also provide the materials necessary for all of our pollinators and many people only think that it's insects or maybe butterflies or things like that but it really is bats and it's birds and it's all sorts of insects flies and beetles and butterflies and moths and wasps so you want to plant plants that will attract all of those things and then you can call it a pollinator garden right well ed i know it's a simple question but i do want to ask um what is a pollinator and why should we care what a pollinator is? So a pollinator, uh, as Linda explained, it could be an insect or a butterfly or a bat or a, a bird. And it goes to the flower usually to get a, a, a the food source, the nectar. And while it's there, it gets pollen on its uh, self, mm. uh, on its body. And then when it moves to another flower to get uh, some more food, some more nectar, it takes that pollen and transfers it to the other flower. Mm-hmm. And because of that, we then get pollination. And that pollination can then uh, bring us either seeds for us to grow new plants, but also brings us our food. Um, mm. So a lot of our food comes because of the result of pollination. Right. So they are kind of what the unsung heroes, yes, right? Yes, they are. So what, um, what, uh, is there a specific type of garden that I need to create in order to attract certain types of pollinators, or is the overall goal just to attract all of them? Generally, with a pollinator garden, if you plant plants that attract one pollinator, they're probably going to attract more pollinators. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. some of the things you want to take into account when you are planting a pollinator garden, if you want to use native plants, if at all possible, Mm -hmm. because they're adapted to our climate and our soil, Mm -hmm. and the insects that utilize them are also adapted to those native plants. So that's the first thing you want to do. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of our insects are kind of nearsighted, so you're going to want to plant those plants in groups, not Mm. just one here and one there, because it makes it easier for them to find. Mm -hmm. And also, bees have something called flower constancy, where they like to kind of pollinate on one particular plant before moving to another particular plant. So that helps them out, too. Something else you want to look at is some of our pollinators come out in the spring. Mm. Some of them come out in the fall. Mm. And you really want to have flowers that are blooming from spring to fall. And that's where some of the non-native annual bedding plant comes in, too, because it can kind of fill in the holes, and they kind of tend to bloom the entire season long. So there's certainly nothing wrong with having some non-native annuals in there as well. Right. And if you want to attract butterflies, you need to have host plants, too. And that's what caterpillars use, and they're very specific about which plants that they use. And, of course, you don't want to have any pesticides either. Pesticides do not go along with pollinator gardens. And generally, pollinator gardens are considered sun gardens. Mm. But you can also have shade gardens as well. Right. Now, Ed, um, one of the things I wanted to find out as well is um, what attracts these animals to these flowers? Is it all about color? Is it about scent? Because a lot of times you're thinking, oh, you know, I don't, I only want to have really awesome looking flowers in my garden. But is that, is that the the whole thing? Well, um, it's partially right. There are, uh, the colors that we see are not the colors that the insect sees. Really? Yep. So they're, they're going to see different patterns and you can uh, see pictures where 
the uh, collar pattern that the insect sees is more like a kind of can be like a runway and directs mm. them right to the center of the pollen, uh, where the pollen is, where the nectar is. Um, but also the type of plant is going to attract them. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Linda mentioned, uh, you know, uh, having plants for the larval stage of caterpillars, milkweeds, that is going to attract those butterflies because mm -hmm. it can only put its, lay its eggs and rear its larva on those milkweed plants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, so, not a color, it's not a color thing for that. It's, it's, it's knowing what that type of plant is. Right. And, and that's, that's, that's important because I guess that um, certain pollinators are kind of specialized as far as what they're Absolutely going to Absolutely they after. are. Right. Absolutely. And it's important to have diversity in your plants because of that. Mm -hmm. Because some of the pollinators prefer flat flowers. Some prefer more cupped flowers. Some prefer tubular flowers. Some prefer a combination of those. Yeah. Some prefer astrotype flowers where you've got the ray and the disc flowers. And they all have different mouth parts, and so they are able to get nectar from specific types of plants. So the more diversity that you have in your garden, mm -hmm. the more chance that you're going to attract many different types of pollinators. Right. Okay, so let's go ahead and maybe go over a couple of, of common ones. All right, let's say, for instance, I want to attract butterflies. Okay. What kind of plants can I, um, can I get? Butterflies, like uh, they like bright colors. So you're going to want to get sun plants because butterflies and sun pretty much go hand in hand. Okay. They have to have a certain internal temperature in order to use their wings, the muscles okay. of their wings. So you're going to want sun plants. You're going to want plants that have lots of copious amounts of nectar okay. because they're after nectar. That's the energy food for mm. insects. Okay. Now, if you're looking for bees, you're going to want plants that want more in the way of that have more in the way of pollen. And believe it or not, there are differences in plants. Hmm. Some prefer more nectar than others. Some some uh, make more pollen than nectar. Some right. don't make nectar at all and only make pollen. Right. So, you know, it depends on what you're after. But if you're after butterflies, you're going to want the ones that have nectar because that's what they use as their energy source. Okay. So that's a good thing to consider, too. Okay. They like plants that there's many flowers like I don't want to say butterfly bush because a butterfly bush is not a plant that you necessarily want in your butterfly garden. And really? you can't say I've got a butterfly garden just because I've got my butterfly bush. Here. Why? Those are non-native plants. Uh -huh. In many states, they are considered invasive. Mm. In Virginia, they're actually not because they don't care for our our clay soil that much. Right. But still in all, there are too many wonderful native sources to just say, oh, I've got my butterfly bush, that's all I need. Right. But a butterfly bush illustrates the fact that a certain type of flower can have many different florets on it hmm. with all producing nectar. So those are very, very good. Right. I would say anything in the aster family, the Asteraceae, those are certainly excellent flowers for butterflies. No question about right. that. And many in the mint family as well, the Lamiaceae. Hmm. In fact, I would say one of my favorite <laughs> plants for um, butterflies that is native is mountain mint. And to us, it huh. is not that pretty in terms of a flower. But, oh, my Lord, does it ever attract pollinators. They're just <laughs> thick as thieves on there. Really? Wow. So, Ed, a, a common name laundry list for like six plants to attract butterflies. Oh, six plants to attract butterflies. So uh, a good one is, um, oh, Linda, I'm drawing. Lantana is Lantana. great. That's the yeah, one, that's the one, the that's the one non-native one I would put in every butterfly garden. Okay, and what color What color of flowers yeah. does that one have? It's multicolors. Yeah, really? you can give them yellows, oranges, reds. Okay. Um, pinks. Yeah, pinks. There's a multitude of colors. Yes. Most of them are annuals. There are a couple perennial ones, um, marginally hardy in our area. Right. Um, so those are good ones. We've Probably black-eyed Susans. Black-eyed mm -hmm. Susans, yeah. yep. yep. Um, Rudbeckias. Um, and um, purple cone flowers yep. are yep. another and, one. And bee balm is bee good balm. for yep. both butterflies and bees and wow. hummingbirds, too. And Linda mentioned mountain mint. Mm -hmm. Definitely mountain yeah, mint. Right. It's a wonderful yeah. perennial. Okay. Uh, and that fills up an area so quickly. Yeah. Uh, right. It's got the name mint in it. If you know anything about mint, mint they run. Mint runs <laughs> oh, and fills yes. up an area. It's, it's the same family. <laughs> so yeah. that's a great plan. If you've got, you know, you get one and by year three, it's taking over and filling up a right. good amount of space. Right. And again, provides that big area for your pollinators to come right. in and get. Bees. Bees. Mountain mint is a wonderful right. <laughs> one for, for bees. And just about any of the other flowers will do. Again, right. trying to for bees is, is a lot more of making sure that you have that full season. Mm. So going from the early season of planting flocks 
uh, low growing ground cover for those early season bees uh, and then mountain mints and then going all the way to um, Joe Pie, uh, Joe Pie weed. weed and uh, New fall. England mm. um, asters, you know, for the fall, you know, getting right. that full season because bee, uh, bees are only out for a short period of time. Okay. And um, so there's different bees at different seasons. So you need to make sure you've got something for all the different bees throughout the entire season. Right. Not just um, a couple of weeks that they're at each, each species is active. What are some of the common bees that are in our area? Well, let me address bees because when people think of bees, they always think of English honeybees. Mm -hmm. And English honeybees are non-native. Right. They were brought over by the settlers back in the 1600s, primarily for their wax and for their ability to make honey. Mm. And uh, they, they are in hives, which is why they're so easy to transport across the country to pollinate large crops like the almond crop. So people always think that those are the only bees that matter, right. but that's not true. Mm. Honeybees are actually not that great in terms of pollinators. Mm. We have 4,000 species of native bees in the United States. and wow. in, the, in any state, you have about 400. Now, about 70% of those are going to nest in the ground and about 30% are going to nest in cavities. Mm. But they are covered with hairs and the hairs that they have on them attract the pollen mm -hmm. and it's dry. English honeybees tend to stuff them in a little packet on their leg right. and they mix it with um, nectar. Mm. And so it's not as dry and easily transferable. Even though they do pollinate, the native bees are far more, they are far better pollinators right. than our non-native English honeybees are because they literally belly flop on the flowers and just get covered with pollen. Yeah. Then they take them to another plant and they do the same thing. So they're far better as far as pollinators go. Right. A couple of examples are uh, mason bees, for mm. example. They're out in the very, very early spring. They're the ones that will pollinate some of our earliest flowers, mostly tree flowers, uh, blueberries, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The mason bees will do that. And then for our summer bees, the leafcutter bees come out, and we've got right. numerous species of leafcutter bees. But there's also, of course, bumblebees, and bumblebees do that sonic um, pollination mm -hmm. where they actually vibrate mm -hmm. the anthers in order to get the pollen to drop out because yep. any plant in the eggplant family requires that buzz pollination. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of native uh, bumblebees that will do that. We've got mining bees. Those are frequently the ones that are down in the ground. So they're all different kinds of bees. Wow. And, and the they're fascinating. From yeah. teeny, tiny, tiny to great big. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe not that big. So the bumblebee ones, they're the, kind of the big ones. They're right? the big, the ones, hairy ones. Look, they have armor right. and everything. They're the yeah. big, hairy ones. <laughs> but if you see a big bee and its rear end, its abdomen is shiny, yeah. that's a carpenter bee. Really? If it's covered with hair, that's a bumblebee. Interesting. Interesting. And I never knew, you know, the different types of bees. So, um, so how do I... How do I get started? Because, you know, there's there's a, a lot of people that, I hate to say the term, that may not feel that they have a, gr a, a green thumb. How do I get started on this? Is it really hard? Can I step into it? What do you think? It's very easy. It okay. could be just as easy, simple as, as picking an area and planting a couple plants, a group of three of the same type of plants. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. gets can get it started. You could even start it even simpler than that in having a, you know, 10 or 12 inch container on a deck or a yep. patio or on the sidewalk yep. that could start to attract pollinators. And then you can move that out and then go from there. So one year, maybe you start with three of this one type of flower and you've, you know, made a, a you know, two square foot garden. Right. The next year, you, you add another group of three or something different. Mm -hmm. And then you just add and keep adding and dividing. You don't have to go out and you know turn your whole yard into a garden right away. Right. That's very that is very overwhelming. But you can start as small and as simple, you know, uh, as you know, three plants. Again, trying to provide enough plant material to give them something visually to come to do. Right. And like uh, Linda said, those bees they want to pollinate all those little flowers of that one little group. Um, so that gives them something rather than just one flower, and, and then they can't figure out where to go from there. Right. And so. Um, Let's talk about maintenance a little bit. I understand I probably need to have a, a water source that's close by. Right. What What are some other considerations? And and maybe like we can briefly just touch on the idea too of do I need to fertilize? Do I need to you know? Right. And if Pesticides. so, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That that the best part of having a pollinator garden that has mostly native plants in it is that there is not as much maintenance as you would think. 
the native plants are they are adapted to our climate and our soil. Mm-hmm. So and they mm-hmm. are also adapted to the local pests. Mm-hmm. So as the pests come in to those native plants, the predators of those pests come in, Mm -hmm. and you really don't have to use any pesticides at all. In fact, there really is no place for pesticides when you're trying to attract insects. Mm -hmm. And the same is even true of of those people who spray for mosquitoes. They kill everything. They don't just kill the mosquitoes. So we won't (laughs) go into that, because that's a sore subject for me. But you don't really need any kind of fertilizer. They get what they need out of the soil. Mm -hmm. You don't really require any kind of pesticides. Yes, you should have a water source, but again, these are not plants that need to be babied, like some of the tropical plants and stuff that people put in their yard in the right, summertime. Right. They don't have to be protected during the winter. Mm-hmm. They don't have to be overly coddled in the summertime. It makes it much easier. And as winter comes on, you can just leave them up through mm. the winter because all the seeds and so forth, and just the fact that they're, they're there and can serve as, as hiding places for insects and so forth during the, the wintertime. Right. Uh, that makes it very easy. So in the spring, the best thing that you can do is just cut them back and leave stems that are about six or eight inches tall. Right. And a lot of our cavity nesting bees will use those then hmm. as places to put their eggs. And as oh. the, the new growth comes up, it covers it up. Wow. So it really makes it a lot easier for people that you don't have to babysit the gardens. Cool. Cool. So Ed, I'm going to give an opportunity for a little shout out. Um, where can people get information about how to do all this stuff? So you can reach out to the Henrico uh, Cooperative Extension Office, Mm -hmm. and we have wonderful resources. We are also um, where the master gardeners work from. And so we have a horticulture hotline um, that is staffed by master gardeners, and they can come. You can uh, give us a call or shoot us an email, and we can help you with some of that gardening information or resources that you might need. Right. And, you know, and I'm always into puns and stuff like that. So reaching out to you all is really not bugging you, right? <laughs> <laughs> nice dad joke. Yeah, baby. Um, also, I wanted to also ask you, too, is um, flowers are visual. Gardens are visual. So are there any representations of, of decent or, or good um, example gardens in the area that I could go and look or our other folks could go and see? Absolutely. And I I mean, Ed can cover this one as well as I, but we have the Armor House Garden out in the East End near Mm. Arthur Ashe Elementary School. Okay. And it is specifically for butterflies, but of course it attracts other pollinators as well. Right. And then we also have a larger garden at Short Pump Park, Mm. the Short Pump Park Pollinator Garden. Mm. And that is an excellent example too. And I also wanted to tell people that if they're interested, they can start looking for native plants Mm. in this plant guide that was specifically done by Plant Virginia Natives for our area. And there's a key inside Uh for each plant that indicates what it needs in the way of sun, what it needs in the way of moisture, whether it's a host plant, whether it's a pollinator plant. So this is an excellent guide to start with to get a list of plants. Right. Then they can go to their their local greenhouse and ask for them. Right. And if they don't have them, the greenhouse might say, you know, I'm getting asked a lot for native plants. Maybe we should ought to stock more. Right. And they actually are stocking quite a bit more. And there's other resources they could go to as well. I would recommend the Xerces Society online. Mm-hmm. Excellent resources for pollinator plants in your area specifically, usually by zip code, they'll do it. Right. And also the pollinator, um, pollinator.org, the pollinator partnership is excellent for that too. Great. So what else? What else have we that you want to share? Well, you know, 80% of our flowering plants require pollinators mm. in order to make seeds. Yep. And Every They say one out of every three bites that you take, you can thank a pollinator. And that's <laughs> true. But people don't realize the fact that that close relationship between pollinators and plants is so important. And if that does not occur, it affects everything all the way up the food chain, including yep. us. So when you talk about plants and pollinators, they're the basis of the food chain. Mm-hmm. If you take them away, you're hurting yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the more we realize that, perhaps the more we can get on, on board right. with not spraying all these pesticides and not using all these fertilizers and so yeah. forth and letting nature do what nature does. Mm-hmm. And really, it does seem like a circle because you think about it, you know, the, the, the pollinators help us, but they need a habitat 
Right. So they need a, a right. hand as well. I don't know if you call they it a hand or They certainly do. A... They certainly do. <laughs> and we have a tendency to want to be very, very clean in our gardening habits. Yeah. And nature loves mess. Yeah. So, you know, we this is giving us permission uh-huh. to be messier <laughs> nice. in our gardening. Wow. Because many of our pollinators over winter under leaf litter. And uh-huh. so what do we do? We rake it up and it's, it, it's taken to the dump, you know. Yeah, so if yeah. you leave your leaf litter, particularly in your planting beds, uh-huh. not only are you feeding your soil, but you're also helping the pollinators. Wow, that's great. Anything else? Another thing is to clear up some misconceptions. Mm. Too. I think Linda's mentioned bees and wasps uh, as pollinators. And I think sometimes that makes people afraid of yep. wanting to plant. Good point. Uh, yep. Yep. You know, to attract them because they're afraid they're going to get stung. Um, the majority of the bees and wasps that are coming are not aggressive. Yeah. Um, they are usually solitary. Uh, they uh, ground nesting or um, cavity. Cavity, cavity nesting, mm-hmm. uh, not hive nesting like uh, the European honeybees. So they're not really uh, aggressive and you can have them and you can walk by them and they, you know, they may get on you, but they're, they're going to realize you're not a plant. Uh, you're not a flower and they're just going to go off. They're not trying to, um, you know, sting you or anything like that. Right. Um, right. And the same thing with the wasps. A lot of the wasps are even really, really small. Very small. Um, mm-hmm. that you probably did, would would look at it and think it's probably a fly, not necessarily a wasp. Right. Um, but again, they're not aggressive. Right. And and the one last thing too that, that at least I would like to throw in is that you know there's also the uh, the the aesthetic aspect of flowers. They help us. They give us joy. Right. They Absolutely. help us. Um, calm our lives, slow down a little bit, and then just see the beauty of them and just take a minute to just kind of chill out and see that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nature saying, hey, I'm here. Yeah. You know, so. There's been studies done where they have shown people plant palettes. Yep. And when they are shown the plant palette of the area where they grew up, right. there is brain activity that indicates peace and calm. Mm-hmm. So it's we don't really think about it, but nature really, really does. Yep. We are we are part of nature. Nature is not somewhere else. We're part of nature. Exactly. And it can really have a profound effect on us right. and our emotions. Well, very good. Yeah, people love to have bird feeders to watch the birds come Absolutely. and eat. This is the same thing. It's a, it's a pollinator garden. So, yep. yeah, we may attract some birds, uh, but we're going to get those smaller insects. You can still get out there with your cup of coffee in the morning yep. and sit and watch and watch these bees and other insects just flit around and go from flower to flower. And, yep. and it just is amazing. It's cool. and, it, and, it, and it does help relieve that stress. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate you all coming on the, the uh, podcast today. Um, that sharing the information is always makes me feel good. But then the folks that are listening or watching, I hope they're picking up some good stuff as well. I hope so too. And um, we also want to point out too, that we have our friend Stuart on the table here and he's our mascot for our Henrico heart. And um, he has various different phrases, but in this situation, I think Stuart reminds us to be good stewards of the environment. <laughs> sure. So anyway, thanks a lot. And uh, we'll see y'all next time. Okay, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you.